Good morning. So Bacher. I'm going to bring the readings this morning. And Mohammed is going to bring the readings in Farsi for us. There are two gospel readings this morning from the Gospel of John. The first is from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 7. And the second one is from John chapter 10, verses 7 to 11. So the first reading is from John chapter 14. Verses 1 to 7. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? After I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And the second reading is from John chapter 10, starting to read at verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lindsay, and mercy, Mohammed. <clears throat> uh, today's message is going to be about life. It's going to be about Jesus saying, I am life. And uh, I want to just open in prayer. Lord, we just commit this time to you. Let the message not be mine, but your message for people here. Lord, help us all to learn. Help us all to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, before I started, I just wanted to see a show of hands. How many people have ever heard of the man George Verwer? Okay, quite a few of you, yeah. Um, George is the founder of Operation Mobilization, uh, the organization I'm with. Uh, George actually passed away uh, on Friday, so you probably haven't heard that news. And so he was very influential in, in my life. Uh, I joined OM in 1988. And one of the reasons I joined OM, one of the main reasons, was George Verwer. Uh, he, um, 
He spoke at the missions conference, Urbana 87, where 20,000 people came to this conference. And, uh, and through that message uh, was sort of like the final thing for me to join OM. And I'm still with the organization over 30 years later. So he was very influential. So um, heaven has gained a great person uh, these past couple days. So I just wanted to share that before, um, before I speak. So we're going to be talking about life, or zendagi in Persian. It's important, um, it's important, and the word life has been coming up on my radar quite a bit lately. Zan zendagi azadi is something that the Persians know well. It's the chant against the ruling religious parties of Iran. It stands for woman, woman, life, freedom. As a crisis manager for the past 10 years with Operation Mobilization, uh, I've actually managed a few life or death crisis situations. And I've recently reflected on some of these situations that I've managed. In most of these situations, these crisis situations, the missionaries uh, have, have lived through it, flourished after the crisis. But in some of the situations, our missionaries have actually died on a field bringing the gospel message. So today, here, sitting here, we're all alive. And, but we're all going to face the end of our lives. Some, at some point here on earth. So what is life? Now that sounds like a really philosophical question. I'm not a philosopher, so I'm not going to go down that, that route, but we're going to look at it from a spiritual standpoint. One of my favorite verses in the Bible was from the first reading that was brought to us, John 14, 6, in which says, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus isn't saying, I am pointing to the way. Jesus isn't saying, listen to the truth in my message, or how can you get a better life? He is saying, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So today we're focusing on Jesus being the life. So Jesus said, I am the life, or in Farsi would say, Isa Masi Goft, Man Zendagi Astam. And we want to just pursue that theme. Missions, this is a mission service. Missions is all about pointing people to life pointing people to Jesus. But why? Why does the organization I work with, OM, we have 5,000 workers currently from over 100 countries, ministering in over 100 countries. Why do many of these wor workers risk their lives on a daily basis? And some have actually laid down their lives. What message could possibly be so important to do this? Two things, really. One, it's so people can experience a fuller, richer life with God while they're alive. And secondly, to have eternal life with God in heaven after they die. Without Jesus, people simply do not have this fuller life as they live out their lives. There's an emptiness, or as I say, a God void in their lives. They also do not have eternal life with God after they die. There will be an eternal separation for them. A question for us here today, do these two things motivate you? Do they motivate you to take action, to pray, to give, 
to go yourself. So do missionaries make a difference? Yes. Can missionaries make people Christians? No. Can Anthony or other church leaders or any of us make people become Christians? No, can't do that. It's a step between each individual and God. However, we as a church here or missionaries in far-flung places, we can point people to Jesus and the life he offers. We can share from the Bible. We can also share our individual testimony about how God has changed our lives. It's then between the individual and the Holy Spirit for someone to become a Christian. It's a new birth, a spiritual birth. And just recently, this past week, I was at Spring Harvest with Lindsay, and Tiffany was also there, and Tiffany's daughter gave her life to the Lord. Um, she's here today in the, in the kids' group, Kathy, and uh, so we praise God for that. It is that new birth, a spiritual birth, and we thank God. In John chapter 3, we see what missionaries often see, someone privately coming to them, knowing about Jesus as a teacher of some sort, or in the Islamic world, they know Jesus as a prophet, but they want to know more. And it's like John chapter 3 where Nicodemus, he came to Jesus in the night, privately. He was searching and he wanted to know more. What did Jesus tell him? He said, ye must be born again, born of the Spirit. How does one do that today? Anyone can be reborn by accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Taking that step is a rebirth of the Spirit. I refer back to John 14, 6, where he says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. That's being born again. This applies to faraway lands. This is a mission service. But it applies to people sat here today also. Jesus said, you must be born again. Are you? Have you made a personal choice commitment to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? If so, you know life. You have life. If not, you will not have access to God. Sitting in the chair here today at All Saints does not get you this life. Only Jesus does that. He said, I am the life. And if you've made, never made that decision to follow Jesus, to accept him as Lord and Savior, I urge you to do that today. Don't leave this place without doing it. Experience life to its fullness, and you will be reborn. Well, so how does missions work from a practical standpoint? People need to hear about Jesus so they can understand that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. This sounds very much like the verses in Romans chapter 10, which was actually one of the keys, the calling for me to become a missionary. In Romans chapter 10, verses 13 to 15, it says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent out? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, missionaries. But why missions? Why shouldn't people just stay here where we're at and share about Jesus? We know there's a need in Blackpool. 
Why go to places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Burkina Faso, Nepal, to name a few? Simply, people need to hear so they can respond, so they can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved, to be born again in the Spirit. There are no church buildings or gatherings of Christians in Afghanistan. The Afghan underground church is estimated to consist of between 500 and 8,000 Christians. That's in a population of 40 million believers. So let's just say there's 4,000 believers. That's the middle of that estimate. So that means there's one in every 10,000 people in Afghanistan who are Christian. So I'm going to ask the people in the first two rows here to stand up, and also Gwen. OK, that's seven. OK, people behind then, uh, another seven people stand up, please. What do we got here? We got, OK, one, two, three, four. OK, so we have 14 people standing. Now, thank you very much. If you look around, this is the 14 Christians in Blackpool. If, if it was like Afghanistan, Blackpool has a population of 140,000 people. So if it was like Afghanistan, there would be 14 Christians in Blackpool only. OK, you can sit down. Thank you. Didn't know you were going to be uh, called into service, did you? So 14 people. I googled churches in Blackpool, and it came up with 65 churches. So there's 65 churches in Blackpool. We're just one here. And the people in the first couple rows here, that would be, if it was Afghanistan, the total number of Christians in Blackpool. So um, you can see why it's so important to bring the gospel to places like Afghanistan, Burkina Faso, Nepal, Pakistan has a 1.27% um, uh, Christian population. Nepal, 1.4%. The 2021 census in the UK says 46.2% of people in England and Wales describe themselves as Christian, so about half. And I understand not everybody is true Christian that, that says that, but um, we, we can really see the difference between the UK and other places around the world and that there's a great need to share the gospel so people can hear so they have a chance to choose to follow and have life, zendagi, with God. In John 11, when Lazarus died, Jesus had a conversation with Martha. Martha said, if you had been here, Lord, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know he'll rise in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus then said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And then he raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus' death and resurrection leads to eternal life. Jesus rose first and paved the way for all of us. This is the hope missionaries bring to the world. This is the hope many missionaries have laid their lives down for, to bring this message to the peoples around the world. So believing and committing to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it gives you eternal life when you die. So the question is, 
Is Christianity just like a life insurance policy? It only kicks in when we die. Is that what it's about? Is that why young people don't consider it mostly today? Because they think, well, I'm not going to die for a long time. Maybe I'll think about it when I'm 60, 70, 80 years old. If it was like this, if it was just a life insurance policy for eternal life, I would still be a Christian because I know it would be well worth it. But it's so much more than that. It's important to understand that Christianity begins, eternal life begins when you make that individual decision to accept Jesus' death and resurrection that it applies to you when you make Jesus your Lord and Savior. This is the rebirth Jesus talked about with Nicodemus that night. When you're reborn, you start your eternal life with God at that point. A short part of that is here on earth, and then the rest is in heaven for eternity after you experience the physical death. You will never experience spiritual death. What does Jesus say to us about that uh, time we live on earth as Christians before we have that physical death and before we go to heaven? There are a couple things I wanted to point out. Firstly, that it's not a passive life. We're not just sitting here waiting for heaven. We are God's means to bring this good news to the world. Here in Blackpool and around the world, this is mission. Jesus said at his last command in Matthew 28, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, including Blackpool. Amen. Secondly, as believers spreading this message, we will experience difficulties. Jesus, said to him, Jesus himself said to the apostles when he sent them out on a mission journey in Matthew 10, he said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. He also told them, but when they arrest you, and he said, you will be hated because of me. So how does this sound like a good thing? When we follow Jesus, we're going to face problems. But we know no matter what happens, Jesus is there with us. Jesus makes a great promise to us as believers and a great promise to missionaries. He says in John 16, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. As believers, we can have peace that, is, that the non-believing world does not have. Lindsay and I experienced that peace when I had the cancer diagnosis 10 years ago. There was a seven day period where we had to wait for the results to see if the cancer had spread out of the prostate. We knew there was a significant amount of cancer within the prostate. So um, they said if it has spread, they would just treat to prolong my life as long as possible, but it would be a matter of time, a couple of years. So that's an interesting thing to hear, you know, you have a seven day wait, uh, especially when you have a 14 year old and a daughter and an 11 year old son at the time, that you may only have a couple years to live. Lindsay and I had an amazing peace waiting for this news that could only from, come from God. We did a week later hear that the cancer had not spread which was a great relief, but I am sure God's peace would have stayed with us if the result of the test had shown that it had spread. This is the peace that can only come from being born again. So back to missions, missionaries. Being a missionary is tough and filled with challenges. What's the worst that can happen to a missionary? probably being killed by bringing the good news. It's tragic and difficult for those left behind. But for the missionary, 
himself or herself, it's eternal life. Go to heaven, to a better place. Remember what Paul said, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Heaven is our ultimate destination and is a gain. What else does Jesus say about our life as Christians before physical death moves us on to heaven? Jesus said in our second reading, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, or in some versions, in abundance. What does that mean for Christians in today's world? It actually separates us from the world in a lot of ways. We live in a very messed up world. War, crime, greed, sin, all around. It's, it's a very difficult world to navigate in. Christianity gives us so much in the midst of all that goes on. It gives us the assurance that God is with us. We do not have to be or we do not have to feel alone. He promises he'll never leave or forsake us. We can also have peace. How difficult is it to have peace, to be at peace with what transpires every day in our world? The injustices that we see. Injustice is something that bothers me a lot. And I see a lot of it in our world, and I see a lot of it as a crisis manager for an organization working in a hundred different countries. As much as I hate injustice and try to fight against it, I take heart knowing that God will deal with it in his way, in his timing. He is the ultimate judge. I have peace knowing that. Jesus says in John 14, 27, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give, as, give that to you as a world that gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. That's the beauty of life, our zendagi with God before we die and go to heaven. Our eternal life starts when we are reborn by the Spirit. We have this abundant life. We have it now, never being alone, having peace, and we'll have it when we die. We'll have that complete healing in heaven with God for the rest of eternity. So missions is about bringing new life, rebirth opportunities to all people around the world. It's tough, and many people have died doing it. A few years ago, I led a crisis team as we, OM, had two trekkers in Nepal from South Korea, uh, Ji Sung from South Korea and Thomas from Netherlands. I have a picture, I don't know if you can put that up. Um, yeah, that's Ji Sung from Korea and, and Thomas from the Netherlands. Um, Ji Sung posted a video the day before they got lost in the jungle. They got lost going to a remote village. And uh, he posted the video. I actually showed that in a sermon I did uh, during lockdown. Uh, it was an online one, so I don't know how many people saw that or not. Um, but I actually showed that, uh, that video. But Sisung, in the video, said that they're going to trek into harder conditions up higher because he heard that there was a village there that did not know about Jesus. And he said, we have to do it. We're compelled to do it. And he sent this video on to his church. And, um, and then uh, a couple days after that, um, we, the leaders in Nepal did not hear anything from them. So we formed a crisis management team at that point, thinking that they, there might be some problems. They got lost off the, off the trails um, and into a um, harsh, very harsh environment, jungle environment, 
um, with drop-offs and things. And we're talking, you know, we're not talking like a small park or something. We're talking miles and miles and miles of jungle terrain. And uh, we, we ended up uh, with professional search teams, helicopters, sniffer dogs uh, going through this area. And it wasn't until about three weeks later that both men were found dead of natural causes after becoming lost in the jungle. Ji Sung and Thomas knew the risks, but they had peace about their risks and are now in heaven for eternity. They knew the importance of bringing that message to the lost. So what is missions? Missions is about offering the green shoots of being born again to this hurting world. It's showing people that by trusting Jesus as Lord and Savior, they can have eternal life, life in abundance. Not necessarily easy, a life where we can have peace in a crazy world and then life in heaven forever. There are shirts that say, choose life, an anti-abortion slogan. I say, choose life is making a decision to follow Christ, being reborn of the Spirit. Let's choose life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for all the missionaries out in the field right now. We think of the testers. We think of others, Lord. And um, Lord, we think of the 5,000 in OM around the world, teams in Afghanistan, elsewhere. Father, help them to bring these green shoots of life to a hurting world. Lord, if there's anyone here that hasn't experienced this new life, Lord, I pray that they will not leave this place without talking to me or talking to Anthony or someone, and Lord, that they can attain this new life, commit themselves to Jesus. So Lord, we thank you for who you are, what you've done for us, and that we can follow you and have you as our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.